And finally, in the UK, universities have very close links with business. If anybody goes to the city of Cambridge these days, that city is surrounded by new business startups which are based on the research undertaken by that university. British universities and polytechnics are constantly in touch with businesses to consult them over a range and the content of the courses that they offer. So the supply of courses is designed to meet the needs of business and the demand of students is adjusted to meet the requirements of business. So what does this mean in practice? Well, let me illustrate it because yesterday I went to uh, Tech, Tech Tuesday in Amman. It happens every, uh, Tuesday, every first Tuesday of every month and we showcased a wide range of new industries based on tech city in the UK. This part of London is the fastest growing cluster of creative, technical and digital companies in the world. With typical British irony, it used to be called Silicon Roundabout. And it was just a roundabout in part of London where a number of companies had gathered. It was nothing like Silicon Valley. But Silicon Roundabout has now become Tech City. And it's the base for a growing number of startups, innovators, entrepreneurs, and multinational companies. And I think that's an illustration of the success of the approach that we've been taking. But underlying these policies is a wider British government emphasis on the private sector. The aim of government is to reduce the number of jobs in the public sector. These jobs, after all, have to be funded by the taxpayer. And at a time of economic crisis and government deficits, more public sector jobs are unsustainable. So our British government has announced a cut of 300,000 jobs in the public sector, even cuts in the armed forces. And yet unemployment has stayed around 8% because the private sector and inward investment has picked up the extra jobs. So in this way, the UK has adapted its economy and played to new strengths. We've changed from an old-fashioned economy based on heavy industries like coal, steel, shipbuilding, to a modern economy based on financial services and high technology. <coughs> so that's the UK experience. How can Jordan play to its strengths? Far be it from me to uh, to have clear ideas or to dictate what policy should be, but I have some thoughts which I'd like to share with you. Education has always been a big strength in Jordan, but the jobs challenge is getting bigger. Jordan's working age population will grow from 3.4 million in 2009 to 6 million in 2030. And remember that the figure of 12 to 14 percent <coughs> unemployment hides the fact that only 35% of the working age population is economically, is economically active. That means 65% of the working age population is not classed as unemployed, but as economically inactive. And just as a thought, I'm not sure you can continue to rely on, the long, in the long term, on a lot of high paying jobs in the Gulf. So the fundamental point is the need for young people to decide for themselves how to prepare for employment. This might mean going for a course that is less prestigious. It might mean doing a science course rather than the humanities. And it might mean doing a vocational qualification rather than a degree. But surely it's better to get a job rather than be unemployed with a high class degree. Therefore, tailoring your skills to meet the demands of the jobs in the private sector is the best way to get ahead. And it seems to me that a policy shift from the public sector to the private sector worldwide is both inevitable and essential. Concentration on public sector jobs stifles creativity and entrepreneurship. But the private sector jobs that need to be developed have to be those that Jordanians are qualified to do. Many private sector investments in the past have generated jobs for foreigners rather than for Jordanians. So the key is to develop small and medium enterprises. But did you know that 99% of Jordanian companies are classed as SMEs, but those companies attract less than 10% of finance? So an initiative, for example, like Oasis 500, which trains young entrepreneurs and helps attract investment, is an important way to shift that balance. The British Embassy has foster funded their training. I've been in 
pressed by the passion and creativeness of the young people attending their boot camps. And my conclusion from that is that there is no shortage of talent and potential in this country. One final thought. I've concentrated very much on ways to ensure that young people emerging from schools and university have skills that are attractive to employers. <coughs> but education must be more than that. The education system isn't worth a great deal if it teaches young people how to make a living, but doesn't teach them how to make a life. It should also create active, committed citizens with values and attitudes that contribute to their society. That too is crucial. So let me leave you with a quotation. <coughs> Education is not to reform students or amuse them or to make them expert technicians. It is to unsettle their minds, widen their horizons, inflame their intellects, and teach them to think straight. That is an exciting agenda for any country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent, and I, I think we have uh, a lot to learn from what you said. But I would like, before we open the floor for discussion, I'd like some to give us some more, uh, educate us more on the Silicon Roundabout, because we may we may consider doing something here in Jordan. I'd like to learn about that experience if. If you could, uh, okay, and uh, about Oasis 500. Okay, well, Silicon Roundabout started up without any government involvement at all. It just happened to be um, a, a run-down part of East London, just to the northeast of the city of London, with a lot of old um, clothing factories which had closed down. They, they they had become uneconomic. So a lot of uh, young uh, people bohemian sort of people, artistic uh, people, started to uh, occupy those buildings and began to start up little industries. And you know, when little industries start, they attract um, cafes and restaurants and things like that. And people found that uh, they, they would bump into each other at, 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 in a coffee shop and find that people were doing similar things. So they began to set up an informal network and found that they were all doing little IT idea ideas, they began to form um, a reputation as a place to come and base yourself. And it, it, and it just grew and grew and grew. But it was a private sector doing it individually. So all we've done now in the, in, as a British government initiative is not to interfere in it in any way whatsoever, but to um, appoint someone as a champion to go around the world and to go around the UK also and advertise this as an opportunity and as a place for people to come and invest. And it is now the fastest growing cluster of IT and creative industries, certainly in Europe and I think also in the world. And you know, it, I think it's created now about a thousand new little SMEs who are, in, who are doing this sort of business. The other factor is that it's only about two or three miles down the road from where the Olympics are going to be held this summer. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, it's a very attractive proposition. We, were, we, we hijacked Tech Tuesday in Amman yesterday to, uh, to put on a bit of a show to advertise a bit more about it. But if anybody's interested, I've got my colleague here, two colleagues, three colleagues from the embassy, uh, two of whom are experts in Tech City. And if anybody's got any questions, Suha and Shuruk, I'm sure will be very happy to answer them. Um, Oasis 500, of course, is a, is a Jordanian in initiative, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure many people here are aware of it. Um, their idea is to take uh, young entrepreneurs, not just young, but entrepreneurs in the IT sector, and to put them through a boot camp, give them the skills and training necessary mm -hmm. in business, in finance, and then how to pitch their ideas uh, to angel investors, and they help to incubate those companies, uh, and then get some of them they will invest in themselves, and then some of them they will allow to pitch to the banking sector or to others. Um, we found that this was uh, uh, a worthwhile investment of our time, and we, we are only funding training. We've funded six boot camps. I think three have happened, three have yet to happen. Um, and I found, in terms of playing to Jordan's strengths, it's taking IT ideas, um, very often ideas already developed in the West, uh, injecting Arabic content and then marketing it to the rest of the Middle East. And just as one small example, 
um, a young man from East Amman who's found that he couldn't order Arabic books on Amazon. So he said, I'll create my own Amazon. Mm -hmm. and he's created his own Amazon-style uh, book buying online in Arabic, and he's found a way round the way uh, actually purchasing online is not that easy at the moment in some parts of the Middle East. He's found a way around that, and he's developing his business. And I think it's got huge potential. All of those companies have got huge potential, but also it is generating jobs in that sector. So I, I, we, we will continue, I think, to, uh, to support Oasis 500, because it's a very exciting project. Now, uh, I'd, I'd, I would welcome any... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Well, uh, thank you for this uh, precious occasion to be here with the Ambassador of Britain, UK, and Atal Wazal Establishment. I'm uh, Dr. Fawaz Abdul Haq from Yarmouk University. Yes. Uh, education is preparation for life. Yeah. And uh, uh, education aims at not radically changing our behavior, but influencing our behavior. Now I have a question. Uh, education at the eve of a globalization. Globalization aims at uh, uh, hegemonization, not homogenization. How can we make a compromise between uh, aiming at hegemonization, not homogenization, or vice versa? And again, back to the question of westernization, if it indicates or entails with, uh, imitation of West, even education-wise and otherwise, how can we uh, compromise between local education and the global education? Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sure, sure, yeah. sure, sir. The point I made about each country <coughs> play, playing to its strengths, because you're right, there, there isn't, there's no one model that is going to fit everybody. I mean, I, I gave you five or six examples from the approach in the United Kingdom, um, but I'm certainly not saying that that is a formula which will work everywhere. Uh, I feed that in as some ideas for people to think about, because some of them might be valid here, but obviously there are historical and cultural issues here which make the implementation of some of those things difficult. But I do think it's then up to each society to pressure its politicians to take the decisions necessary to fulfill the potential. You're right, the education is preparing people for life, but uh, are young people actually able to fulfill their potential in the economic environment, in the economic ecosystem of that country? And if they're not, then it's up to each country to decide how to adapt its structures and its policies to meet their needs and to draw on the lessons from others and if some of those lessons don't work, fine, but move on and try and find other ones that do work. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. My name is Majdi Shweke. I'm from the telecom sector. Uh, while uh, during your speech, you said, well, we, know, we all know that uh, Jordan, in terms of level of education, is really high. And another strong statement that Jordan is not short of talents. So in your observation, Jordan is short of what? 9.7% of Jordanian companies are, are SMEs. The 0.3%, the I think, includes your company, Maj. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the diplomatic answer that, to that is that I leave it to you to draw your own conclusions. <laughs> but I don't think you want me to cop out in quite that way. Uh, but I mean, I, perhaps Oasis 500 is the example which is a means of taking talent and developing it to meet the opportunities. I think, I think one thing which is missing here, and I defer to the journalists here to take, whether to take note of this or not, is a clear voice from the private sector. I don't hear a clear voice from the private sector of what you need and a dialogue with the government about what you need. And I think if there's anything missing there, it's that dialogue and that, uh, that messaging about what you need to see coming out of the education sector and what you need to see in terms of a government facilitating all the opportunities that you need. Thanks,